Okay, welcome once again, Chemistry 3202 course overview. This is the last recording for the review course. This is going to be a combination of two lessons, lessons five and lesson six. And we're going to look at any energy production and cells and batteries. And we're also going to take a quick look at the STSC reading that's posted in the content link. So here we go. If you want to look at some textbook readings on this, there's selected pages in the textbook from page 764 right up to 801. And we're only talking a couple pages. Uh, and there's a few textbook uh, practice items here that you can try. And we have a little hot water tank here. We're going to come back to that one shortly. Let's uh, let's get into this stuff here now. Uh, here's some of the the outcomes um, for this particular lesson. There's a lot there, but it's mostly definition. Um, and we're going to look at some of these. Okay, the very first thing we're going to look at is the definition of what a battery is. And a battery, they say, is um, Galvanic cells are electrical chemical cells. And the idea that in order to get a battery, you're going to have to have two or more cells connected in series. And the reason for that, I guess, is because an individual cell by itself, for instance, if we had a, a zinc and a copper uh, galvanic cell set up, that would give us a voltage of 1.1 volts. Now, we wanted to run something like a 6-volt flashlight battery. We'd have to have six of these connected in series in order to generate six volts of, of electricity. So one galvanic cell by itself doesn't produce enough voltage, so we would connect them up in series. And we would connect enough so that we would start adding up to get the voltage that we desire. Okay. Um, we know from the study of galvanic cells that the electrons are being produced at the anode because that's where the electrons are being produced from the oxidation reaction. Remember, Leo is an ox. Loss of electrons is at the anode. It's oxidation. So the negative terminal of a battery would be the source of the electrons. Um, another definition they like to come up with here is something called a load. Now, in a circuit, when we refer to a load in electricity, we're referring to anything that's going to burn or consume that electricity. So it might be a flashlight bulb, a speaker. It could be the electricity as it goes through your cell phone, and your cell phone uses the electricity. So the load would be that, that item that's going to use the electricity. Okay. Um, typical types of batteries, the very first type of battery we're looking at is the uh, first one's called a primary battery. You might consider these to be disposable. Primary means one, so they have one use. So we use them one time and one time only. These guys cannot be recharged. They cannot be recharged. When this battery is completely depleted, when the reactants in the battery are consumed, the, bat the, the battery itself stops. Uh, when either the reducing agent or the oxidizing agent is completely consumed, it cannot be reversed. But you might be thinking, well, why can't we reverse it? Why can't we put uh, pass an electric current through this and just reverse the chemical reaction? And one of the reasons, in some of these batteries, we have a, a wet paste. And what happens is, in the reverse direction, instead of doing the reverse direction of what the electrochemical cell, what happens is the wet paste, there's water there. And we say, aha, anytime we have water present, we run the risk of saying that the water may be easier to oxidize or reduce, and therefore we may get the production of hydrogen or oxygen. And, and that's exactly what happens. The, the um, electrolysis of the paste produces the hydrogen, and that builds up pressure inside the cell, and the cell could actually rupture. Um, or the, the hydrogen gas, of course, is flammable, so it could actually catch on fire and explode. Very dangerous. You could probably start a fire if you try to recharge one of these primary disposable batteries. Some of the typical primary batteries that we're used to seeing here, these guys, would, this one's called a button battery, all right, for obvious reasons. It looks like a button. These ones would go in things like um, wristwatches, um, small electronic devices where we, you know, low profile is important. Things like pacemakers, where you might have a pacemaker inserted for your heart. Um, very low profile, and they're not going to stick up and be very clunky. These guys down here, we've got our typical AAA, AA, uh, Cs, Ts, and 9 volts. All right, things like uh, fire detector, smoke detector batteries, and flashlight batteries, remote control batteries, and things like that. Um, 
We also have uh, what's called dry cells, and these are the cheaper batteries that you can buy. They don't last very long, do they? The alkaline batteries, the Duracell Energizer, the lithium batteries these days, the ones you get for your digital cameras, um, these last a lot longer and produce a more steady current that the electronic device uh, would require. Um, a secondary battery, or the second type of battery, is what's called a secondary battery. You know, secondary means two, so it has more than one life. And in this case, they're called rechargeables because uh, we would have typical batteries like a NICAD rechargeable, um, or lithium batteries that are in, say, a cell phone or an iPod or something like that. Car batteries are also rechargeable. They're known as lead storage batteries or lead acid battery, and they're rechargeable. And of course, what happens here? This is a battery that's out of a mobile phone, all right, or a cordless telephone, and they're rechargeable. And here's a NICAD battery system that you can buy just about anywhere, I guess, where you would use your batteries. They deplete, and then you would put them in, and they would recharge. So in this case, um, they remove the possibility of the production of hydrogen and or oxygen. All right. So in this case, it's not a danger. If I had to take one of these Duracells and put in this charger down here, we're running the risk of the Duracell, you know, rupturing and exploding and possibly catching on fire. Um, for the NICAD rechargeables, that's not going to happen. All right. So they're designed specifically to uh, to be recharged. So the uh, process is reversed. Have a look at these on page 787. I got a couple diagrams here. I'll come back to that page now in a second. Here's a typical dry cell. And the, the significance of the dry cell is these were the first batteries. They didn't last very long. They weren't very good. Um, but nonetheless, they were the first batteries. And these guys were the first ones here. They used what was called a, a uh, manganese oxide paste. And it replaced the aqueous solution that we would have in the typical electrochemical cells that we've been describing up to this point. You know, We've been using beakers. You put zinc in zinc ions in a zinc solution. Then you put a piece of copper in copper solution. You needed your salt bridge. And you know it was a clumsy system. You wouldn't be walking around with that trying to run a flashlight, because if you tripped and fell, you'd spill it all, and then the battery would obviously be dead. So in this case, uh, it, it actually it's a nice, you know, nice tidy package here. This is where it's cut into. And it's, it's a portable battery. We can actually move it around without worrying about spilling and whatnot. All right. Here's a lead acid storage battery. And this is a typical car battery or an ATV battery or Skidoo battery or something like that. These guys are rechargeable. And the idea being is that you know, a typical car battery is 12 volts. Well, in order to generate 12 volts, we need several um, sets of cells in series. All right. So here you're seeing um, a lead and a lead oxide um, electrode. All right. And they're separated by porous barriers. And each of these guys, of course, would be representing an individual cell. And they would be in series to create the 12 volts. Now you notice that this guy has gas vents here. And that's one of the reasons, of course, because as this battery gets recharged, the aqueous solution of sulfuric acid, the water um, could possibly produce hydrogen gas. And we would want that hydrogen gas to vent so that the battery itself wouldn't rupture. And number two, we want it to vent so that it wouldn't create an explosive situation. This is why you have to be very careful when you're boosting a car or something like that. You have to worry about the presence of hydrogen gas here. The battery could potentially catch on fire if it's not vented. Okay, if you ever recharge a battery, make sure it's in a well ventilated environment. Okay. Here's an alkaline cell comparison. Now this is one by one of our technical people. They were in the process of ordering batteries for all our vast numbers of remote controls and electronic devices that use batteries. And we were looking at uh, trying to figure out what battery is the best one, which one would last longer. And these are the different alkaline cell batteries that you can buy. And he did a comparison of the typical ones, Energizer, Duracells. Uh, this would be the Kirkland Price Club's Rayovax. And this would be likewise. I'm not sure where that comes from. Maybe Shoppers Drug Mart or something like that. And what he did was he hooked the battery up to a 100 kilo ohm resistor. And he just let the battery deplete itself. All right, The resistor was being load. And he recorded the voltage over a period of time. And what he noticed is that every single one of these alkaline batteries has the same energy dissipation profile for the most part. And what was interesting is that this purple one here, the Rayovac battery, which is one of the cheaper ones, actually stayed charged longer. But once they went dead, of course, they all died very, very quickly. And what we're noticing here is that 
A pack of Duracells or Energizers for these alkaline batteries are going to cost you anywhere from four to five bucks for probably two or four, depending what side you buy. Um, you can go to Kirkland or Price Club and get them eleven for forty-eight, and you notice that in 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 a sense the performance difference is negligible. Their performance is almost identical. Um, and that's probably because all of these all of these batteries are probably constructed in the same way, using the same electrodes with the same electrolyte. So they're all constructed the same way, which gives us the same energy profile. So the moral of the story is, um, you don't have to go spend a whole lot on batteries as long as it's an alkaline battery. Then it's going to last for a fair amount of time, depending on its use. All right. So there you go. Okay. Um, Another one we're looking at here now is something called a fuel cell. Now this is fairly new, I guess, on the scene. Not real new, but it's it's getting more and more popular. Um, and what we say is it's called a flow battery. And what it is, it's a, it's it's the reaction where we're going to take some hydrogen and do the oxidation of hydrogen and the reduction of oxygen to get electrons. Now this is what's in more modern cars. These ener the energy efficient cars that are on the go these days. The the um, fuel cells is what they're using to create electricity, which drives the motor, which would then um, move the car. All right, so we look at this, and this is what's happening in the fuel cell of the battery. And the reason they call it a flow battery is that the battery will never go dead as long as we're continually adding hydrogen to one cell and adding oxygen to another cell. So as long as we have a source of hydrogen and oxygen, we can keep this battery going perpetually forever as long as we continue to add the uh, the reactants there. Um, now the beauty part of this reaction is the fact that when we combine the two half cells, the two half cells is simply the reaction for the combustion of hydrogen. And we'll say, hey, that's pretty neat. Now hydrogen and oxygen is what they use to fuel the um, space shuttles into orbit. They have liquid hydrogen in one tank and liquid oxygen there, and when they ignite it, we get a great big kaboom. Now we don't see that in the fuel cell of a car. We don't get this vast amount of energy coming off all at once as you would in a rocket. What we're doing here is we're controlling the flow of energy by putting it in a fuel cell or an electrochemical cell and thereby the energy of the electrons, which would be the exact same amount of energy in these bonds if we had to ignite it, the energy in these bonds is being released through an alternate route. We're harnessing the electrons. All of that energy of the electrons is now being turned into electricity. So we're getting the exact same amount of energy, but getting at it from an alternate form. So there we go. So fuel cells are pretty neat. And the neat thing here is we're getting a lot of energy but we're not getting any pollution. We're not getting any carbon dioxide or sulfur emissions that you would get from burning gasoline or coal. Um, very clean. And uh, you know what comes out the other end is just water vapor. And it's very, very clean. OK. Here's how the fuel cell works. Um, it's a little complicated diagram. But what's happening is we've, you can see that the, the fuel cell is separated into its two half cells, the anode and the cathode. On the anode side, we're seeing the oxidation of water. And there's your reaction from the other page. Hydrogen reacts with hydroxide to produce water and two electrons. Okay. Now on the cathode side, the oxygen is being reduced. And hence, that's why it's called a cathode. So in this case, I simply rewrote the equation again from the other, the other page. And oxygen plus water is producing four electrons and four hydroxides. Now, the beauty part of this reaction, it's a real nice, neat package. We've got our porous barrier here, which is controlling the flow of hydroxides. And look what happens to the hydroxides. It's being produced as a byproduct in this reaction. So basically, it's a waste on this side because it's a product. What do you do with it? We don't have to do anything with it because as soon as these hydroxides are being produced, they're immediately being pulled to the anode side, right? Because anions flow to the anode in any electrochemical cell, anions to the anode. And lo and behold, the hydroxide now is acting as a reactant on this side. So it's a nice, neat package in that it's pollution free. There's no waste. There's no byproducts being produced. We harness the electrons as they flow from the anode to the cathode. And our load would be you know, the stereo in the car, the electric motors that move the, the wheels, um, the control panels, all the electronics will be run from this electricity. 
All right, so it's pretty neat. Um, so it's pollution free. Now the problem, of course, comes from where do we get our source of hydrogen and oxygen? Well, for the most part, uh, we can go and get it bottled up, right? You can go and get the, the hydrogen and oxygen, which is going to be produced at various plants and whatnot. Or if you had some water and set up some electrolysis of the water, you simply have to plug in the car at nighttime and let it recharge. And what we mean by recharging this time is we're not reversing this cell. What we're doing is we're simply doing the electrolysis of water so that hydrogen is captured in one electrode and oxygen is captured in another. So we simply let it recharge. In the morning, we go out and we have lots of hydrogen, lots of oxygen. As soon as we turn the car on, here we go, the fuel cell kicks in. Okay. Now, one of the issues, I guess, about plugging it in and making hydrogen and oxygen is where is that electricity coming from? Is that coming from coal-fired electrical plants, uh, as the ones that uh, in California, where most of their electricity is from coal-fired plants? So people are driving around in their nice, neat uh, fuel cell cars, very highly ener uh, energy efficient. But yet, when they go home and plug it in, the energy that's recharging the car is not so clean after all. So you know, you got to watch and say, well, what's going to be the source of this electricity? If it was hydroelectric. Um, or wind power or something like that, then it would be a purely clean system here where we would have no um, emissions whatsoever. So I guess that's the target, I suppose, in the future. Okay. Um, another aspect that deals with um, electrochemistry is the idea of corrosion. And corrosion basically is the rusting of metals, and we know that it's always not pretty when metals rust. Okay, and here's a couple of examples of where corrosion needs to be controlled. And what we use is something called um, sacrificial anode rods. All right, so we want to be able to protect all the metal parts of our battleships, our outboard motors, hot water tanks, anything, any type of metal that's coming in contact with water and salt spray and things like that are definitely going to corrode. Right, metals definitely corrode. Um, so what they use is they try to put some kind of reactive metal there, something that's going to be easily oxidized. And the metal of choice is going to be zinc or magnesium. And the reason we use zinc or magnesium is if you check your table of re reduction potentials, you'll notice that zinc and magnesium is way down low. They're very, very easy to oxidize. Easier than iron or copper or many other metals that are on your table. So if I had a ship or boat that was made of steel, then what we do is we put a little piece of zinc, of zinc plate here, okay? And the fishermen, if they pull up their boats and put them on dry dock, that's one of the things we're going to check. That they're, they're, they call them zincs, all right? Zincs, and it's zinc plates, and they're about the size of, say, uh, I don't know, a dinner plate almost. And what they do is they put them on the boat, and of course, and it says do not paint. And the reason it says do not paint is we need this metal exposed to the aqueous solutions. We need this to be in the water exposed so that the zinc is allowed to oxidize. We need the transfer of ions and electrons here. So if you painted this over, that would be simply sealing it off, and the zinc would no longer be exposed. So we need zinc exposed. So this piece of zinc metal is going to protect every other type of metal above it on the table. So any any parts on the boat that are made of metal, steel, copper, anything like that, um, the zinc will be corroded before the steel or the copper or anything like that. Um, on outboard engines, all right, you're going to see little zinc fins here. On this particular electric outboard engine, um, the actual washer that keeps the propeller blade on is a zinc washer. And if you ever had to do a replacement job on the propeller, make sure you put back the zinc washer. Do not put a metal one back there, an iron one or something like that. Because if you remove the zinc and replace it with iron, then the internal parts of the engine will begin to corrode. All right. So the rationale behind this, then, is that on your reduction table, zinc is much lower than iron. So what's happening is if the electrons have a choice, then the zinc is going to be the one that's going to be the easiest to oxidize. So therefore, that's the one that gets sacrificed. And we say, OK, fine. That was the design. That's why we have this on the boat. That's why we have that on the outboard engine. It's designed to be oxidized. We're sacrificing it to protect the boat. 
All right, there we go. Um, if we look at a hot water tank, a hot water tank has a little bit more complicated chemistry going on there because a hot water tank is composed of three different types of metals. You've got your copper pipes. You've got your iron hot water tank. The tank itself is made of iron. And inside here, we have a magnesium uh, anode rod, okay? and it's called a sacrificial magnesium rod. And the idea behind this is that the water that's coming into your house is fairly acidic with all the chlorine in it and all the bog water runoff and, and whatnot. Water is, tap water is generally quite acidic. And because of that now, you've got an aqueous solution. So we have the ability with three different types of metals here now, we're going to start seeing an electrochemical cell being set up. So we have to worry about what's going to corrode. And here, the reason they put the magnesium there is because if you check your table, of redox potentials, you're going to notice it's going to go copper, then iron, and then magnesium is way down low. So what we're saying is this is the easiest to oxidize because it's lower on your table. And therefore, we're sacrificing the magnesium to protect the iron and the copper pipes. The problem is, the magnesium rod is only going to last so long. And generally, the warranty on a hot water tank could be anywhere from one to three to seven years. And depending on how acidic the water is in your community, this magnesium rod could start to corrode or oxidize much more quickly than you might expect it to. And therefore, what's going to happen is as the magnesium oxidizes and disappears, the next metal that's in the series, the reactivity series, we could call this a reactivity series, where magnesium would be the most reactive, then, then iron, then copper. As soon as all the magnesium is consumed, and now it's out of the equation, it's no longer present, now the electrolytic um, cell is going to look at this and say, OK, which metal now is the easiest to oxidize? So what's going to happen now is we're going to start corroding the iron. The tank is going to start to weaken. Little pinholes are going to form. And eventually, the tank will rupture under the pressure. Um, so there we go. So the question would be, well, why don't they make the hot water tank so that we could replace the anode rod? And then theoretically, the tank could last forever, 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 forever. Well, if you're the hot water tank uh, company and you're constructing hot water tanks, you don't want them to last forever because that means you're not going to sell very many. All right. Uh, but in any case, there's other issues there too, um, you know, the heater elements and whatnot. But in any case, that's the purpose of the sacrificial anode rod. Okay. Um, there's another way that we can start protecting um, metals that are exposed to the elements, and we could use something called cathodic protection. Now, cathodic protection is just as the name would say. The device that we're trying to protect is going to be turned into a cathode. So to do that, we use what's called a rectifier, or what you would use as a, uh, like the recharging device you have for your phones. It's just a transformer. And that's going to create a small DC current. And the negative terminal we're going to hook up to, say, this, this underground tank, which causes the tank to be negatively charged. Around the tank, we'll insert sacrificial anode rods in the ground. So that could be things like zinc or magnesium. So what's going to happen is, as the magnesium gets oxidized, the magnesium ions are going to attract and stick to the tank because they're going to be reduced on the surface of the tank. And instead of the tank corroding and getting thinner, the tank is actually going to start to get thicker and thicker and thicker. We're protecting it. Um, recently on TV, I think Canadian Tire or some other uh, automotive um, company was advertising uh, cathodic protection for your car. All right. In what case, they put a little transformer on your car and two leads, and they stick it into the metal chassis of your car. So what the idea is, is instead of trying to protect the metal tank, your car is actually what's being protected. So the metal parts of your car get this very small negative charge, which prevents it from rusting, because now it's going to attract the ions. Pretty neat. All right. There we go, cathodic protection. OK, here's the last thing we're going to look at. We're going to look at the STSE reading. And this is on page 796 of your textbook. The STSE reading is in your content link as well. So you may want to get it and read it for content. Um, what I'm going to do is quickly just summarize it here to see what's going on here. So the very first thing we're looking at is mining to metallurgy. 
And the reason that this is so very exciting and important and, and current to us is because we have this going on around us in so many locations around the province. We've got uh, Labrador City and Wabush Mines up there doing the iron ore. We've got Voises Bay doing um, vast amounts of nickel and copper reserves. Uh, we've got um, a, a big plant doing uh, refining now in a few years as soon as they get it up and running in Long Harbor, all right, the, the hydro net plant. And we've got mining and things going on all over the place. Um, so lots of exciting things happening in the mining industry um, in Newfoundland. So let's have a look at it. So the definition metallurgy is simply the science of extracting and refining metals from the ores and the things that you dig out of the ground. All right. So most times, the metals that are in the ground are not necessarily what we call native metals. Native metals are the ones that are in their pure state now. For instance, you would go out panning for gold, and if you found a gold nugget, because gold is denser and heavier than most other rocks that it would be in, the gold nugget would sink to the bottom, and you'd be able to pick it out, because the other rocks would just simply swirl away. So that would be a native metal. So things like gold and silver and platinum, um, these guys are native metals. Um, other metals, things like nickel and copper and aluminum and magnesium, these metals are way too reactive to exist in their native state. You know, magnesium metal in your hot water tank, um, it corrodes before iron and copper. So if there was any native magnesium out in the environment, it would immediately react with the water, and it, it's existing in its ionic form. All right. And when a metal is in its ionic form, we refer to it as a mineral. All right, it's mineral. Um, and things like nickel and copper and magnesium, aluminum, even gold and silver can be in their mineral or ionic form. And unfortunately, when they're in their mineral form, that's when they're mixed with the rocks and the sand and all the other types of things that you dig out of the ground. And we call that an ore. And it's the rock that contains the mineral. And when you hear talk of uh, mining companies referring to the percentage, you know, what percent of the mineral in the rock would require us, you know, would it be viable e economically for us to go mine that rock? So they do a bunch of studies to see exactly what the percentage of the mineral is in the rock. All right. And these days, of course, with the price of metals, gold is about fifteen hundred dollars an ounce. It makes it a lot easier to go about some of these um, these uh, mining some of these minerals. All right, here's some examples of some native metals that you can get in nature. All right, silver, gold, bismuth, copper, iridium, osmium, palladium, platinum. Some of the other ones are going to exist in their ionic form. So here's some carbonate minerals. All right, calcite, calcium carbonate, iron carbonate. It's called siderite. Dolomite, calcium carbonate, magnesium carbonate. Um, halide minerals. We got fluorite, um, sodium chloride, halite. All right, they actually mine that. Um, oxide minerals, we've got aluminum, bauxite. That's where the aluminum comes from when we make aluminum paper or aluminum cans. All right, and you can see that it's in its ionic hydrated form. Uh, cuprite, hematite, magnetite. We know magnetite is that magnetic material that we like to make compasses and stuff out of. All right. Uh, and here's some of the ones that we see up around Boise's Bay. Um, these guys are mostly sulfur, sulfide minerals. The calcosite and the calcopyrite, millerite, pendolidite, and pyrite. All right. Now we know that pyrite is fool's gold. It looks like gold, but it's way, way harder because it's ionic. The gold is a metal. It's a little bit softer. The ionic uh, pyrite structure very, very rigid. You learn that in chemistry 2202. But in any case, here we've got some mixtures of different minerals and pure metals and whatnot. Um, it's going to be the process, what we're looking at is, well, how do we go about isolating the minerals from their ionic compounds? So let's have a look at some of the processes. There's three main steps that um, would be undergone if we had to dig up a mineral. So if we were up in Lab City or Wabush and we were digging up some iron ore, or we were up in Boise Bay and we were digging up some nickel ore or copper ore, the very first thing we'd have to do, of course, is blast the rock and start crushing it up and, and digging it up. And they actually crush it up to the point where it's a fine powder. And they do what's called a froth flotation on it. So they crush it up, and they put it in great big vats, and they chemically treat it. And the ionic compound uh, would float to the surface, and it would be skimmed off, and then it would be put in great big drying vats and dried up. 
So up in Voises Bay, they would have great big mounds of this stuff. In the wintertime, it would start to accumulate because boats can't get in. But in the spring of the year, uh, when we can start getting big boats in, they can get in and, and load the big uh, big boats up with this uh, with the uh, concentrated um, minerals. All right, so this is basically concentrating it. What we're doing is crushing it to get rid of all the old rock and any other material we don't want. And this froth flotation, what comes out, just like having a milkshake, right? That stuff that's on the surface of the milkshake, the good stuff, that's what they skim off and they keep. All right. Now, what they've done here is they've concentrated the ore. And now what we want to do is somehow extract the metal from the ore. So we've got our concentrate. It's, you know, we've taken out all the rock. It's very, very concentrated in the ore. Um, in Voises Bay, there's two options that we're going to be able to pursue. Number one, we could send it to the Sudbury Inco mine, or uh, number one, the Sudbury Inco mine. Number two, we're creating a new what's called a hydromet plant in, in Long Harbor to deal with it in a more environmentally friendly way. So there's two extraction methods that we can do. The first one is what's called pyromet. Pyrometallurgy. So pyro means fire and heat. Metallurgy means you know purifying the metal. Um, so pyromet is what happens up in Sudbury with the copper and the nickel. And what they do, of course, is they have great big blast furnaces that they heat way up above 1500 degrees Celsius. And as soon as you hear the word blast furnace and 1500 degrees Celsius, you got to think about well, how are they generating that heat? Okay, they're going to burn oil or coal or something of that nature to generate enormous amounts of heat. Anytime you burn coal or oil, you're producing greenhouse gases. Coal is very heavy in sulfur, so you're going to get sulfur oxides coming off here. Um, and you know it's, it's going to be problematic to the environment. One of the advantages here is that it's very efficient. You can do a lot of pyromet. If you've got a great big blast furnace, you can do an enormous amount of this stuff quite quickly. Um, very inexpensive for the most part because coal is pretty much dirt cheap for the most part. Um, it's proven technology. We know it works, and it's readily available. Uh, Sudbury Inco mine up there has enough capability to, you know, pump out as much of this stuff as we need done. Um, the only problem, though, of course, is that it's not going to create 100% pure product, and that's a big problem uh, because that means if we want to get a pure metal, that means we have to now treat it some other way. All right, so there we go. So that's one way, pyromet. What's going on up in Long Harbor when they get the facility constructed is what's called a hydromet plant. Hydrometallurgy, that's what it refers to. And it's referring to the purifying of the metal by use of, of water. All right, so it's going to be an aqueous solution. Hydro, hydro refers to water, so it's going to be aqueous solutions. So what happens here is when the concentrated ore comes down from Boise's Bay on these big boats, what they're going to do is they're going to put it in what's called um, heat vents. All right? They're going to heap it up in great big piles. And there's going to be showers spraying chemicals down on top of it. And as the aqueous chemicals start percolating down through the, uh, the, um, the concentrated ore, it's going to be just like a great big coffee machine. Right? As the coffee filters down through the coffee maker, what's underneath is what you want. So the same thing happens is as this solution leaches down through the concentrated ore, it's going to pull the ore down with it. And it's going to purify it that way. And then we collect the liquid that comes out the other end. All right. Now the problem here is that some of these chemicals are potentially hazardous. In fact, they could be downright deadly. One of the materials or one of the, the leaching materials we use for, for uh, leaching gold is actually cyanide compounds very deadly. And I'm not mis um, you know, if you had a leak of cyanide into the environment, that would be very deadly to any fish or anything around that would be in contact with it. So you'd have to be very, very careful that, you know, you don't have any leaks, so there's going to be all kinds of protections in place so that the leach the leach A uh, doesn't escape into the environment. The advantages here, I guess, we have fewer impurities because you know we're we're selecting the chemicals that we want to extract. We're selecting the leachate, and we're being specific. You know, if all you're going to do is throw something in a great big vat and burn it, I mean, how specific is that? Whatever's in the vat is going to melt, and that's going to go along with what we get at the end. In this case, if we selectively use the chemicals that we want to be specific to certain metals, then we're going to get what we want and nothing else. So much more pure. Uh, less pollution because we don't have to use enormous amounts of heat. 
Um, and one of the things here, sulfuric acid is a byproduct. We recover it and we could sell it somewhere else in some other industry. Um, and therefore, we can, you know, even though it's a byproduct of our reaction, we can sell it again and uh, make money on it. So, you know, it's not so much a byproduct after all. Um, the next step, once now that we have this is this done, we've got to refine the metal. We're still not at the 100% pure uh, point. And there's there's two things two things that we can do. Um, and one's called electrowinning, which is reduction of the dissolved metal at the anode. And the other one's called electrorefining, where we would have to, first of all, try and separate the metal from its uh, ionic compound, and then we would reduce it. So electrowinning and electrorefining. The problem here is that this is electrolysis. It requires an enormous amount of electricity. Electricity, you say? That's not a problem for us. We got a great big project that's proposed for the lower Churchill, don't we? All that electricity, that's coming our way. That's going to Long Harbor. Um, it's clean energy. It's hydroelectric, and therefore problem solved. Newfoundland is a happening spot. If you haven't noticed already, Newfoundland is, is going somewhere. There we go. Okay. Um, so how do we refine the nickel now that we've got it separated from the ore and we've we've tried to purify it a little bit? How do we go about it? Well, the first way is called um, and through pyramid extraction is what uh, they do the electro winning process here, and they do something first what's called the MON process, where the nickel sulfide is going to be converted to nickel oxide, and they're going to do that by using a lot of heat again. So again, that's that process that's going to produce. Uh, carbon dioxide emissions because we have to burn coal to get that heat. Uh, and we still have to do the electro refining in order to remove any impurities because the sulfur is going to hang around and it's going to be very difficult to separate these two. So you're still going to get some of this remaining in our finished product. And again, we still have nickel oxide. We still don't have pure nickel. So what's going to happen here, we do the electrolysis, which is called electro winning. And what's going to happen is the nickel sulfide is then placed in the container and it's going to be uh, oxidized um, at the anode, and then the nickel 2 plus that's formed is going to be reduced at the cathode. So let me just give you a little schematic of what's going on there. All right. So here we've got the nickel sulfide that was produced through the pyromet technology. All right. That's what melted out and came out the other end. As we pass an electric current through this, we're going to see the oxidation of the nickel sulfide to produce nickel ions. And if we hook this end up to the negative electrode here, so we're going to see the, the anode on this side. And because this is where the uh, reduction is occurring, this is going to be the cathode. So we're going to see the reduction of nickel over here. Nickel 2 plus plus 2 electrons produces the pure nickel solid. And it's going to be 99.9% .9 pure once we do this. Okay. Now, the whole problem with this process is it's pyromet. And we don't like pyromet because it produces carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide. All right, our end product is pretty good because of the electrolysis process. Now, with the hydromet plant, we've already got it in its aqueous form. Because remember how the pyromet works? The pyromet works by leaching the chemicals in an aqueous solution. So the the nickel oxide or the nickel sulfide is actually dissolving in the chemicals that were, were leaching down through it. So the nickel is being converted to an ionic form in its ion form in the aqueous solution. So we're going to skip this step right here. We've already got it floating around in the solution. So what we're going to see then is simply take our hydromet leachate, all right, the stuff that percolates down through, and we're going to take that now, and we're going to do the electrolysis or electrowinning on that mixture. And here's the schematic of what's going on. Now, the beauty part of this process is that in Boise's Bay, it's high content of nickel, copper. There's some gold, and there's some silver there as well. And this is all coming out in our leach. Um, and what's going to happen is we're simply going to look at each metal on the table, and we're going to say, hey, gold. Copper, nickel. As we're looking at these guys, we're seeing that we're going to go from the easiest to oxidize. This one now is going to be, I'm sorry, the easiest to reduce. Plus two, uh, three electrons, 
goes to gold metal. Copper two plus plus two electrons goes to copper metal, and then nickel two plus goes to nickel metal. And this is the easiest to oxidize. So what's going to happen, though, even though we've got a mixture here on our leachate, uh, what's going to happen is, as we pass this electric current through, the very first metal that's going to start to uh, reduce out is going to be our gold. So we're going to see the gold starting to plate out on that, on that anode, sorry, cathode. And because of that, what's going to happen is all of the gold is going to be selectively taken out of this solution. The nickel and the copper will not come out as long as I keep my voltage at the voltage of gold. As soon as all the gold is removed from the container, now all the gold is gone, all right, I take the electrode out, I'll place it with a refreshed one, and now I'll turn the voltage up again, and now the next metal that's easiest to reduce is going to start plating out. So now I'm going to start seeing some copper sticking on that electrode. Once all the copper is gone, now I'm, and, and this is 99.9% .9 pure for each of these metals. Once all the copper is gone, I turn the voltage up to the voltage of nickel, and lo and behold, now the nickel starts getting attracted to the cell. And what we're going to see here, of course, is the production of some nickel. And what we're doing is selectively removing each ion according to its specific voltage, according to its ease of being reduced. Sorry, easiest to reduce. What did I say there? Easiest to oxidize. Let me fix that. Easiest to reduce. There we go. And that's the process that's going to happen out in, uh, in Longhammer. Okay. Um, on, the, on the anode side here, of course, there's water present. And what's going to happen is we're going to see the, the, um, the oxidation of the water to produce oxygen gas. Not a problem. Uh, they'll probably recover that and be able to sell that as well. Okay. Uh, but there we go. And this is going to be in huge, huge vets. Okay. This is going to be on an enormous scale. Um, and you're going to get tremendous, tremendous amounts of nickel and copper and gold and any other metal that might be there, and they'll be selective as to what it is they're going to pull out. All right, I think I've talked long enough. Um, this is great. Uh, I hope you do well on the final and public exam, and I hope this has been helpful to you. Um, and if you don't mind, give me some feedback. Let me know how I've done here, if I'm any good, if I... If I can do things to improve, let me know so that the next time we can make it better. Um, you know, let us know what the good things are. Let us know what some of the bad things are, and we'll see if we can't straighten some of this out so next year it's a better, better product. All right. In the meantime, uh, good luck on your, on your final, and uh, I hope you do well, and I hope you're successful in all your future endeavors. Okay. Bye-bye for now.